and now I will begin the presentation. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? And see a white screen at present? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Everything is as, as it should be then. So tonight, my topic is life or uh, life as uh, it affects our thinking about what the future could be and should be. Now, people mean different things by the word life, and there are debates about what is life that kind of go in circles because you don't have uh, people are talking about different concepts using the same word. Uh, for my purposes tonight, I'm going to use a very well defined, I think, and that's a, the fact that it is well defined is a, is is profound uh, use of the word life. There's a unified phenomena that we find here on Earth that is what is commonly called life. And tonight I will talk about its our foundations of our understanding, the frontiers of current day research and the horizons that we see opening up towards the future. So first foundations, and let me hasten to justify the claim that I'm talking about something definite here when I talk about life on earth. This is the one and only illustration that you'll find in Darwin's Origin of Species. It's the first, first version of what's now called the uh, tree of life in biology. The idea that all forms of living things that you find on earth have a common origin and are linked is was was Darwin, Darwin's conception or um, hypothesis or prediction, if you like, uh, based on his understanding how life of how life might evolve. We've come a long way since then, but this vision seems to be uh, true in a very precise way. It has been extremely fruitful. Uh, it appears that life on Earth is a chemical phenomenon. And we've come to understand that the things that are commonly called living on Earth that are all related uh, share many commonalities of metabolism, heredity, and aspects of perception that we are be, are coming to understand in some cases deeply in some cases more in a more exploratory way at the molecular level and because of that uh, we can trace the code of life the genetic code of a wide variety of organisms as well as metabolism, you would get a very similar tree, you, you find that um, you can trace how the underlying code has changed over time and uh, in great detail map out how different species are related to one another and how um, they branched off from common ancestors. And this is a beautiful, illustration, the modern tree of life uh, in, encodes a, a wealth of precise data, shows that uh, humans and metazoa, animal life that we usually, usually uh, encounter at zoos, uh, are at a molecular level closely related to fungi, bacteria, and other one-celled animals, and uh, that there's a plausible line of descent that links them all. So there is a well-defined phenomena that corresponds to what's commonly called life on Earth. And it's a chemical phenomena whose 
which is largely enabled by special aspects of the chemistry of carbon. The chemistry of carbon is often called organic chemistry for historical reasons, but it's not altogether misleading to say that life is a manifestation of carbon chemistry. The thing about carbon is that carbon atoms can form robust but not completely unbreakable bonds with one another. So they can be linked into structures, but at the same time that are reasonably stable, but not uh, hopelessly stable so that you can, uh, you can change the structures and they can uh, play games with one another. Carbon atoms can also bond to other atoms. And importantly, carbon atoms are happy to support four bonds. In chemistry, we say that they, they have a valence of four. That means if you have a string of carbons linked to one another, they can also uh, link to other things or they can branch. Uh, you can have uh, carbon linked to two other carbons or even three in principle uh, that, uh, that can support branching a branching backbone. Let me show a couple of examples that illustrate this general point that these features of carbon chemistry support an explosion of possible quasi-stable structures. You can string them together, branch them, link them to other things. And here is an example of a molecule that's very important to me, an organic molecule. The light blue ones, are representing carbon atoms. In the right-hand side of this figure, you see uh, what's called a space-filling version. These are all versions of the same thing. Uh, in, in the right-hand picture, you see what's called a space-filling picture, which is a more or less cartoonish, but uh, less cartoonish than the others, uh, version of how charge is distributed in this molecule, uh, the light blue uh, one regions are uh, centered on carbon nuclei, and the dark blue ones are centered on nitrogen atoms, uh, not nitrogen nuclei, the and red is oxygen, and, and white is hydro hydrogen. And uh, that, so that's that difficult. Uh, to read at a glance what that uh, structure is because things are in front of one another. So the next level of cartoon is in the lower uh, lower left-hand part of the picture where you have the famous kind of ball and stick uh, uh, representation. And you can see how the carbons can link to other uh, carbons or to other things and start to make rings or, or branched structures. And then finally, in the upper left, you have what you'll, uh, what's easily printed in books. Uh, and so is, and is very convenient, a representation of this kind of molecule where uh, the carbon is so plentiful in life that uh, when you see a vertex where there's no label, that means carbon. Uh, hydrogen is so plentiful that you fill out the diagram to uh, make four bonds out of each carbon. So there's a, a kind of shorthand, but uh, basically you can see how the upper left-hand uh, representation mirrors the uh, lower left-hand representation. And this, either of these versions gives you the idea of the potential wealth of structure you can get by just adding more things and stringing them along in similar ways. Notice that some of these bonds are double bonds. And so uh, that, that means, well, I, I won't go through the, the precise chemical meaning of that, but, but uh, it, when, when you count four bonds out of each carbon, uh, some, sometimes there are double bonds between carbon and other things or carbon and itself. What is this mystery molecule? Well, it's a brain enhancing molecule. This is caffeine. <clears throat> and just looking at the structure, you could, it would be hard to guess what it does. 
Uh, and much of the story of 20th and into the 20th century of biology is understanding from uh, molecular structures what they do yeah. Yeah, physiologically. <clears throat> this is one of the large, one of the earliest uh, sort of intermediate size biomolecules to be uh, understood. This is vitamin B12, which whose structure was figured out by the great uh, X-ray crystallographer Dorothy Crawford Hodgkin, who also figured out insulin and won a Nobel Prize for this kind of work. Uh, one, I'll just make one remark here about this. It's similar to the other one, uh, except that there's a new element in town at the middle. Uh, Cobalt, which is a very unusual uh, molecule in biology, but does appear in uh, this vitamin B12. So besides carbon, the main players in life are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, basically the elements that are low in the periodic table and uh, uh, common on Earth. Uh, sodium, potassium, chlorine, and calcium are important in signaling, and especially in, in their ionic form. They're used in cellular signaling and nervous signaling. And a few other elements, like cobalt in vitamin B12, uh, uh, have important special uses, especially notable, I would say, are uh, the uh, magnesium that appears in chlorophyll, iron that appears in hemoglobin that carries oxygen in our blood, zinc that appears in what are called zinc, zinc fingers that are important in DNA processing. Uh, but these are all uh, niche uses. <clears throat> the big message that I want to take from this quick survey of the chemistry of life is a kind of complementary message. First, that the chemistry is exuberant and clever. You know, big molecules that are structured to fit together and do clever things with each other, uh, to function and make physiological networks, which we'll talk about momentarily. But they are very far from exhausting, life is very far from exhausting the chemical landscape. There are many possible structures that aren't used. There are uh, many possible elements that are underutilized. So uh, that's an important complementarity, which will come back and in, inform the following discussion. Next, I want to discuss life's big idea. I've defined, defined it as a chemical phenomenon. There, are, of course, are lots of chemical phenomena. And what, what is it that leads to this remarkable thing, this unified emergence of uh, a, a chemistry that, that, can, that can think, that can uh, like capture energy from the sun, that can do all kinds of tricks. Uh, and I think life's big idea that occurs over and over again in empowering its different functions and uh, in building it up from simple beginnings is the trick of self-replication with variation. This is central to evolution. Darwin, coming back to Darwin again, he studied uh, different kinds of finches on the Galapagos Islands and noticed that they had different kinds of beaks, which were nicely adapted to the local environment on the different islands, and uh, had the, uh, the, the, the inspiration that uh, there's some variation in the ancestor that uh, can be exploited to adapt to different external conditions. And uh, that, that's 
that empowers the change of organisms that are better adapted to their environment. And this is uh, evolution by natural selection. <clears throat> what Darwin didn't know that we have a much better idea about today is how does that variation arise? And uh, I'm, of course, not, I, I'm ha having to be selective about how much uh, biology I include. So I'm, I'm assuming a certain level of sophistication by the audience, but uh, I'll, I'll backtrack as, as necessary if, if, uh, if there are questions. The, uh, this, we understand now that the uh, basic code of life is, in, is uh, a strand of molecules, DNA, uh, that uh, functions as a kind of program that stores information. I'll, I'll say a few word, more words about that momentarily. But, and by, it's by reproducing that, that, you, that one generation uh, transmits information to the other. Well, one source of variation, while you don't get exact copies from parents to children, is simply error. And error is uh, not surprising in such a uh, difficult copying task. You know, in, it's, it's all done at room temperature in a chemical environment that's co very complicated and messy. Uh, so there are simply errors when, when one tries to copy uh, the basic code from one generation to the other because self-replication is hard. In today's advanced organisms, the script is stored redundantly in the pattern of uh, nucleotides, so-called ACGT, just think of them as letters on the DNA double helix. Earlier versions were cruder and less reliable. They still are used by some uh, viruses and bacteria. Uh, but advanced organisms all use this DNA uh, coding. And become, it comes with an elaborate machinery for readout and error correction, but that machinery is imperfect and errors remain. Those are the so source of uh, mutation that natural selection acts on. An extremely important refinement of the variation and selection scheme is sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, as we all know, is a lot of trouble, uh, but it's also trouble at the molecular level. It's a very, very uh, complex process, but it has tremendous advantages for the possibility of allowing self-replication with variation and therefore the possibility to adapt to changing circumstances. The special features are that instead of just making mistakes and hoping they work out well, uh, when you have sexual reproduction, you get some of your genetic material from one parent and some from the other, but the parts that are swapped are uh, that the, the, the parts that are mixed uh, themselves are working subprograms that make sense. So they're not mistakes, they're just swapping uh, one for the other. There are things that already work just in different ways. Uh, also, because you have two copies uh, of, uh, of the genetic material coming from some from one parent, some from the other, there's more uh, redundancy. And if one is failing the other the other is a backup system and also uh sexual reproduction allows more refined fitness criteria namely uh the males and the females in in animals as they say uh uh find their mates by looking looking typically for successful versions of of the uh of the opposite sex 
successful in the sense of healthy, well-adapted, and attractive. <laughs> no, this, this, this enables uh, more sophisticated selection criteria than uh, survival in, in, a, in a hostile environment. <clears throat> Oh, here's here's a little representation of how the process works that you have a maternal chromosome and a uh, paternal chromosome uh, when the DNA so you have two chromosomes in each cell uh, then uh, the DNA replicates and then uh, you uh, get the crossing over process where pieces of, are swapped and then uh, in the working version that is uh, takes over the embryo, uh, you have some from mom and some from dad. So that's uh, a capsule summary of uh, how self-replication with variation is central to evolution. Remarkably, the same big idea is also central to development in only a slightly different form. In development, one starts, again, in advanced organisms with a single fertilized egg, which self-replicates to produce uh, first two cells, then four, then eight, <laughs> in a very systematic pattern of uh, development where uh, you start with an egg and then you get cells that are more and more uh, diverse uh, gradually and those form organisms and, and the embryo. <clears throat> so uh, in a mature individual, there's still some uh, ability of selected cells to act like early embryonic cells, that, that these are so-called stem cells that uh, can still go into different mature cell types. <clears throat> so whereas in evolution, the variation is mostly accidental or from uh, this crossing over process, in development, the variation has to be much more structured, and we can say it's deliberately programmed. Uh, I'll tell, uh, mention in a moment how that actually works. Uh, but let me also mention that mistakes still happen. However, mistakes in development uh, usually result in dysfunctional cells or cells that uh, recognize that they're defective and undergo a kind of suicide, a process called apoptosis. If both those fail, then you can have cancer, cells that are defective but grow. So, Also, self-replication with variation, again, is central to maintenance and repair. If the organism is wounded, uh, it can repair itself to a remarkable extent. You can have a gallbladder operation and be up and around and functioning pretty well uh, within a few days these days. And this, it's kind of a, a miracle, if you think about it, that, that, that uh, our bodies can uh, respond so well and predictably to such treatment. And it's because there are these stem cells that get orders by sensing the local environment and know what they should do in order to uh, heal wounds. They're all coming from the uh, all these uh, cells that we that are in the mature individual ultimately came from the original fertilized egg. So there's one underlying genetic program, one underlying kind of DNA that's getting used over and over again in all in these different forms. The same genetic code gets reused and repurposed. Uh, this is 
something that uh, is coming to be better and better understood, uh, how it works in detail. It's something called, it was, it, the, the general idea is epigenetics. And very roughly what it is, is that uh, you can make chemical changes on the DNA, for instance, putting additional methyl ions or uh, other modifications uh, uh, that dress the DNA uh, that in effect hide or reveal different segments of the complete DNA code. So the same big code can be repurposed by having uh, switches that uh, either en enhance the uh, visibility or hide different parts as is appropriate to uh, the working of different kinds of cells. And here's a nice picture of how a stem cell can be repurposed uh, In, in, and coaxed into forming uh, different kinds of uh, mature cells. Now, uh, in the in, this happens naturally, of course, in development and repair and uh, maintenance, but uh, scientists are understanding the mechanism incrementally, and we're getting better and better at uh, coaxing stem cells to do these things, and this is a an important way of uh, rejuvenating uh, organs that are wounded or replacing tissues that are defective in some way. So before leaving this discussion of foundations, I want to come back to a profound general uh, consequence of the fact that life is very far from exhausting the chemical landscape that's opened up by the chemistry of carbon. One is that there's plenty of room for frozen accidents. We saw how the tree of life descended from an early, a common early ancestor, uh, and different choices were made about how to implement different functions that if they worked, they were kept, uh, but there might have been different choices that would also work. Uh, but once because of the the fact that the the uh, the subsequent organisms are uh, generated by self-replication with, limited variation when when uh, successful adaptations tend to be preserved. And so uh, initial choices, which might have been arbitrary, get frozen. We have frozen accidents uh, in biology. So for instance, there's no particular reason why our hands have to have five figures, five fingers. Uh, or it's just uh, a frozen accident of evolution. And in fact, horses try to undo it, for instance. <laughs> a consequence of this is that unlike in the case of physics, where you can find fundamental underlying laws that when you unfold their consequences, generate the physical world, uh, there will never be such a thing for biology. You'll never be able to find equations that uh, you put put on a T-shirt and uh, tell you how biology works because there's so much accidental about it that can't be derived. <clears throat> and very important at a, as a sort of encouraging is that things can be improved because of these because they weren't necessarily done in an optimal way. So there can be unnatural but effective ways of alternative ways of doing the things that life does. So let's move on from those profound uh, but uh, 
rather abstract concepts to the frontiers of current day research that spring from the uh, profound understanding of life as a chemical phenomenon. <clears throat> One frontier is uh, genomics. Genomics is kind of the modern uh, descendant and subsumes what used to be called genetics. Genetics is the study of heredity, uh, sort of as looked at at a macroscopic, in a macroscopic way, looking at whole organisms and family trees and how, how uh, the different appearances match up with each other. Genomics, in genomics, you study the actual underlying basic program and you have the complete set of genetic information that includes, now we understand both, the DNA includes both uh, strands that encode the structure of proteins. So it tells ribosomes which kind of proteins to make, uh, but also regular, so-called regulatory sequences that were once called junk DNA, but they're not junk. <laughs> they are places where you can uh, control how the program works. So they're basically switches and often the, the places where you have epigenetic processes that uh, wall off different parts or encourage different parts of the DNA to be um, functional. And th th those proteins get made or not, depending on whether the corresponding DNA is revealed. And one aspect of genomics that I already alluded to, but is extraordinarily beautiful and profound, is that you can compare the genomes of different organisms. And first of all, they all speak the same language and you can see exactly how much they vary or different from each other and construct uh, trees of how, how branchings occurred and that's how you get at the modern tree of life to get, uh, you, you construct it and you construct the evidence for it at the same time. And so uh, this is what a genome looks like of some particular organism. It's a big strand of A's and T's and C's and G's. So this is like the machine code of, uh, of life. And a great dream of modern biology is to, the program of modern molecular biology is to understand how from that code, which in principle tells you how to build an organism, such as a human being, how it actually works in detail. And this vision <laughs> is, uh, may be true at some uh, high level of abstraction, but uh, to actually make it into a working scientific understanding, much less a technology, um, is still a work, definitely a work in progress. Let me show you now um, a few places where progress has been particularly not notable and also revealed what the challenges are. So one aspect is that the uh, sequence of ACs and Gs and Ts uh, tells you through something called the uh, often called the genetic code, uh, how uh, the, when, when, when you, when, you uh, when the, the machinery of the cell reads this sequence, it constructs proteins and uh, the proteins in turn are basically linear uh, strands of amino acids and the code tells you which amino acids uh, you, ha you have. But to get from that information, which is readily available once you sequence uh, the DNA, to 
the actual physical proteins is not at all trivial. This is so-called the because the linear this linear sequence doesn't tell you how the resulting structure folds up and takes form in three-dimensional space. This is the so-called problem of protein folding. And there's been dramatic progress on this problem recently, thanks to machine learning. Uh, and there will undoubtedly be more progress. Uh, so in, in some cases, in simple cases, one can actually predict uh, based on the, uh, the sequence of amino acids and therefore ultimately the sequence of um, ACs and Gs and Ts, what the protein output is going to be as a function as a uh, an entity in three dimensional space, and this can be very revealing. For instance, here in the case of myoglobin, the bottom thing on the left, and uh, hemoglobin, the the bottom thing on the right, uh, when you put together the underlying structures and predict how it's going to fold up, you see that there's a nice pocket where something could be fit in. And that's where the iron containing group, the so-called heme that uh, transports oxygen through our blood uh, is contained. And uh, in, for uh, very sophisticated reasons, it's actually helpful to put four of these hemes together to go from what's myoglobin to hemoglobin. And uh, that's, that's so cool. That's this thing on the right. Once you know the shape of a protein, it often suggests how it works, what it does, and this is a thriving frontier of biology. To go from structure to physiology, is the next big step. Uh, and the overall uh, flow chart is basically is, is very schematically is this kind of thing. You have input signals, which might be external conditions or signals from other cells, could be those uh, ions I talked about earlier or hormones or other things. The, uh, that those uh, change the uh, the uh, the way the DNA gets read out by this epigenetics, and uh, that changes the outputs, and then those outputs become the inputs to the next uh, cell or the next uh, uh, stage in the life of a, of, of a cell, and that's how the uh, the structure comes to life in the sense that it it, it develops uh, temporal structure, changes in time in a dynamic and intelligent way. These networks, the actual networks, are much more sophisticated and uh, harder to understand than that schematic at, at a molecular level than that schematic might suggest and a very big area of frontier research now is sort of incrementally understanding more and more of how these regulatory uh, networks work. Broadly speaking, what they do is implement a kind of logic to say, if, if the pH is this and if the uh, if this hormone is present at a certain level, this is what you should do. Uh, but the, the way that takes place is in detail is uh, implementing a logic that has both changes in time and is an analog logic. So uh, it's very rather different from how uh, uh, conventional uh, digital computers work. Uh, and 
allows kind of flexibility and uh, sophistication that uh, would require uh, lots and lots and lots of transistors to reproduce. <laughs> So those are the regulatory networks that kind of tell which proteins are going to get produced, how fast. Ready, reading out. And those uh, products feed into a bunch of chemical networks that are very complicated uh, to perform actual physiology. So uh, uh, I won't... Uh, even remotely attempt to do justice to all these different interlinked processes that underlie life, uh, respiration, breakdown of food, uh, transport of the energetic molecules that store energy into different places and so forth. But just to show you, uh, this is one of the simpler components that's very important and appears in many uh, processes. This is a so-called citric acid or Krebs cycle which is the nightmare of students of organic chemistry. And uh, this is involved in how food gets uh, broken and it gets used to ex extract, how you extract energy uh, from burning food, food, but also uh, it has all kinds of side effects linking to other networks that uh, manufacture amino acids or do other things. And understanding this was a, an early triumph of organic chemistry. Uh, nowadays, we understand many other different kinds of networks and similar levels of detail and are beginning to understand how they affect each other in different circumstances. So this is hard work. It's incremental work. And it's in many ways, as you can see already from the Krebs cycle, uh, and the experience of chemistry students, organic chemistry students, very challenging for humans to understand. But with the help of supercomputers and machine learning, it's been increasingly possible to make predictive models of how these systems operate in different environments and interact with one another. And that is very important because if we want to control them, uh, utilize them for something or fix them when they're broken in diseases, uh, we want to know how they'll respond to different kinds of interventions. On the subject of interventions, let me just uh, mention one of the real breakthroughs in 21st century uh, technology along these lines of how you can intervene in the operation of cells. This is called CRISPR technology. It's a method of changing the DNA in controlled ways. So it's now possible with considerable precision to replace uh, a, a part of the structure of the DNA molecule with something else, another, uh, and you, if you don't like the pattern of ACs and Gs and Ts that 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 you you actually have, you can replace it with another pattern. And it's important in doing that, of course, that you know uh, what effect it'll have. And that's where all that work of the networks and the regulatory cycles feeds in. Uh, but uh, if you do, if you can figure out what you're going to, what you want to do, then you can do it. And uh, this is what uh, motivated Jennifer Dudna, who was a very important pioneer in this technology, to say, uh, let your imagination run free. What problems do you want to solve first? She's holding, by the way, the uh, so called Cas9 molecule, which is the gigantic molecular machine that uh, actually uh, does the snipping uh, in a way that is informed by having a nice little sample of where you want to, of, of the kind of DNA you want to snip. And then it goes out and looks in 
a given strand of DNA for a match, and that's where you snip. That's, well, that's a very simple-minded, but not qualitatively wrong discussion of what CRISPR te technology is. And this, this is a slightly more detailed version of that. <clears throat> What can you do with this? Well, this is what Jennifer Dudna suggested in an in, in interview as sort of tangible uses in the immediate future. So one thing you can do is edit crops to be more nutritious. Say if uh, you, you know that soybeans produce a very nutritious kind of protein, but for some reason, instead of soybeans, you want to grow corn. Well, you can take the piece of uh, the, the soybean uh, genome that makes its products particularly nutritious and put them into the corn. <laughs> okay, I'm th That's not an actual example, but it's the kind of thing that, that you might do. Uh, you can interfere with genetic diseases. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sometimes there are defects in the development program. Uh, so the DNA that uh, is, is um, working inside an organism uh, leads to diseases. And what you can, and it's a, it, certainly if it's, if it's a, uh, a defect of uh, omission, so that some good protein or substance is not being produced, well, you can modify some stem cells and get them to incorporate uh, the machinery that repairs this defect, this, this uh, mistake of omission. Also, you can target uh, particular uh, nasty creatures that by you, if you identify their characteristic DNA uh, or RNA sequences and use them as targets for your CRISPR system to snip and snip them and uh, kill them. That's... But the most profound, uh, very general, uh, use of CRISPR that's sort of out there, whether we like it or not, is that it can be used to alter genomes in, in permanent ways because these changes can be heritable. So uh, this leads to issues about enhancing human babies uh, or dreams of uh, superhumans and so forth. Very interesting issues that are uh, debated in bioethics, and we can, we can talk about those, uh, if you like, uh, at the conclusion. Let me move now to discussing horizons. If that wasn't horizon enough <laughs> for you. Uh, Back uh, 50 or 70 years ago, uh, the DuPont Corporation, which is, of course, a, a chemical giant, uh, had, and I think they still do, but th that they don't use it so, so much in their advertising, the, the motto, better living through chemistry. And uh, that appeared in... Uh, in Time Magazine, the, the Modern Alchemist, DuPont Corporation. They were great heroes of uh, the post-war recovery of, and, and also making things during World War II. Uh, I didn't notice at the time, but if you look at this Time Magazine cover, which is the, the, uh, the, the CEO of DuPont at, at the time that this Time Magazine came out, I, I can't really read the date easily, but it's there. Uh, I didn't notice until taking a second glance, but once you see it, you can't miss it, that uh, this, this, this chemistry thing on, on the left-hand part of the cover 
has a face, has a couple of faces, <laughs> and is uh, is meant to be a uh, and is it, a very very cute, clever thing. <laughs> But now we can reverse that. Uh, we can use the machinery of life, which is very good at synthesizing complex molecules, and we understand it to do better chemistry through living. There are many examples of possible use of this. For instance, designing organisms that will metabolize oil to clean up oil spills. But one that I particularly like that I don't think has been explored enough or, or, uh, is the possibility of cleaning up the mess that we've made by dumping carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere. Instead of trying to do it mechanically and burying it in the earth, to use a known phenomenon, uh, algal blooms, which are big growths of uh, algae that uh, pick up carbon dioxide and metabolize them and turn them into other things, turn them into algae, basically. And uh, this can, because of the power of self-replication, this can very quickly lead to exponential growth of al algal blooms. And if we have the right kind of algae and can control it, this would be a very beautiful way to capture carbon, <clears throat> capture carbon dioxide. <laughs> Another horizon is fighting disease. Now, disease covers a lot of ground, of course. There are a lot of diseases. But if you actually examine uh, how humans die in advanced countries, the uh, the death rate is pretty low and pretty steady until people get old. So really, there's one big disease that enables all the others. Uh, and until, uh, without addressing that one, it's a very uphill battle to conquer one disease after another uh, and, and try to do as well as the 20 year old body does. So a Tremendous horizon, I think, in biology, a tremendous challenge to our understanding is to fight the ultimate disease of aging. And I could easily give a whole series of lectures on the progress that's being made on this in on different fronts. If you're interested, I recommend that you Google uh, David Sinclair, who is an authority on uh, modern techniques of anti-aging research and also gives practical advice if you want to age more slowly yourself. And uh, the, the, so many problems have to be solved. The aging process is not completely understood, to put it mildly, but progress is being made. And wouldn't it be glorious if this ultimate disease could be conquered? Another Horizon is borrowing life's big idea. Biology has inspired inventors and engineers for as long as there have been inventors and engineers. Birds, maple, seeds, turtles, and fish, for example, inspired Leonardo da Vinci to design flying machines, airplanes and helicopters, uh, tanks, submarines, So you know, when, once you see it can be done, you think about how to do it. But biology's big, big idea though, self-replication with variation, surprisingly, has not yet played a major role in engineering. It could, and it should. It's a very, very powerful idea because among other things, but uh, centrally uh, because of the power of exponential growth. This is what enables a fertilized egg after about 70 cycles of division to become a human body. Uh, 
this is a famous uh, story that, well, I'll, I'll give in very abbreviated form in view of the time. Uh, the inventor of chess pleased the Shah very much. And the Shah wanted to reward the inventor and the inventor was clever, too clever by half. Uh, so he, the, the, the Shah asked him to suggest a reward. And he said, well, I'd like to do something with the chess board. So here's, here's the reward I'd like. Uh, on the first day, put a single grain of rice on, on the square. On the second day, put two grains of rice on the next square and so on. Put four grains, twice as many each, each on each square. And the Shah, who wasn't sophisticated about exponential growth, laughed and said, how could you ask for such a paltry prize? And the, for the first, first few days, it did seem very paltry. But uh, after a couple of weeks, the uh, Shaw realized that he was going to be embarrassed. He was going to run out of rice. And so he killed the inventor of chess. <laughs> That's the power of exponential growth. And if we want to uh, realize the dream, for instance, of terraforming planets to make them nice, habit friendly habitations for life as we know it on Earth, probably the right strategy is to have self-replication with variation and program, um, not algae, but some generalization of algae to do the work because they once they start going they 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 grow exponentially and could easily work on a very large scale also if we want to have dreams of expanding our civilization uh outside of uh, earth and out, especially outside of the solar system that's going to uh, there's a lot of space to fill, <laughs> and uh, it's going to take a lot of scouts to uh, explore the territory, and the plot, and some of it's going to be very hostile uh, territory, not in the sense of con containing hostile aliens like this kind of silly picture shows, but in the sense of environments that are very strange and uh, hostile to life as we know it literally on earth but if you have self-replicating robots that can vary in response to external condition you could very plausibly on a time scale of tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years which is short compared to modern human history but long compared to the lifetime of the galaxy you could easily imagine spreading not human bodies but human civilization its descendants through the galaxy. Needless to say, this this power is also dangerous. As Walt Disney taught us in The Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, here's Mickey Mouse, uh, has learned the, the power of self-replication and has taught broomsticks to do the labor that uh, his master uh, demands of him, the, the master magician of whom uh, Mickey is the apprentice, but uh, the, these guys go, go get out of control. And this is a, a marvelous episode of, uh, of the movie Fantasia. <clears throat> Let me close with reference to one of my very favorite authors, a science fiction author named Olaf Stapleton, who uh, envisaged futures in an extraordinary, extraordinarily imaginative and uh, uncannily insightful uh, series of uh, works. Uh, among which, 
the most relevant for this lecture is uh, a book called Last and First Men, which is meant to be a future history of mankind and, and mankind's evolution. Here, modern man is what he calls the first men, and uh, they evolve, become uh, you know, bigger, bigger heads, you can say more, more, more physically and mentally capable, but get bored somehow and, and decide, uh, and then the change into the third men and the third men produce the giant brains and so forth. I'm, I won't go through the whole story, uh, but let me point out a couple of highlights that I've uh, put in blue here that are, I think, especially suggestive of horizons that are not crazy to think about at all. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, the third men are, let's, let's go back here. The third men are these kind of, uh, playful monkey-like creatures that like to tinker around with life and uh, relieve the boredom of the second men who are kind of uh, too smart for their own good. And the, 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 uh, the third men take on play and nurturing as an end in itself. They decide that what, what they'd rather do than, than think lofty thoughts is play, nurture, and uh, interact with the biosphere in, in creative ways. And one thing that they do, their kind of culminating achievement, is giant brains. Those are the fourth men. Giant brains are not at all a silly idea. Uh, human Human brains evolved in their modern form from or diverged from chimpanzees only in a blink of an eye, evolutionarily speaking. And they have a kind of repetitive architecture that suggests it's expansible. The, uh, the, the big limitation on the size of human brains is that the human uh, infant has to pass through a constricted channel and it's very troublesome uh, even with the kind of brains we have to do that uh, if you had freestanding brains or put them underwater or things like that in uh, then then uh, it's very plausible that the underlying genetic mechanisms that allowed our brains to proliferate build up many many similar modules that uh, uh, gave us the powers that uh, chimpanzees don't have, for instance, uh, that 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 could be carried out on a large scale. Whether you'd want to, well, it's an interesting question. There could, uh, questions about what could be uh, become questions about what should be. Then uh, the Seventh men illustrate a prof another profound horizon of our better understanding of life. The seventh men, uh, first of all, have moved to Venus. The, 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 the Earth becomes uninhabitable for different reasons, but uh, that I won't go into. But uh, in, 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 in Stapleton's vision i don't he didn't realize at that time it wasn't realized what venus was like <laughs> so he thought somehow venus would be a, a a good alternative uh and the seventh men uh the sixth men actually moved to venus but the seventh men are uh find that life is best on venus uh in the air and so they evolve into creatures that are rather different from uh, modern humans, from the first men. And this illustrates a very, very profound point that if humans are going to actually colonize different parts of space, 
Uh, probably they don't want to do it in human bodies as they're currently constructed. Uh, so terraforming is one possibility that make, make the alien environments more like Earth. Uh, but another probably more easily accomplished uh, strategy is to adapt human bodies into different forms that are better suited to the environments you find elsewhere. But even Stapleton's fertile imagination did not envisage in the 1930s the emergence of mind overflowing life. So we're going to have the next lecture where we'll discuss how mind uh, can and is taking forms that aren't connected to this tree of life. And with that, I'm going to close this lecture and thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, at this point, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So uh, please enter your questions into the chat. Um, I'll, there are already a few, so I'll start with those. Um, there's a technical question. Oops, what happened to my chat? Um, from Swanand Kanapurkar, who says, uh, you say one of the sources of variation is error in replication. What are the other sources? And also, do you think all phenotypic variations can be explained from or reduced to the genetic mutations? Well, besides error, besides mutation, uh, another a source, as I mentioned, is crossing over in sexual reproduction. Error covers a lot of ground. And I think, that, so there are different kinds of errors, uh, but I think those are the two main, uh, those are the two main mechanisms to get variation in life as we know it on earth. I should mention one possibility that's uh, very rare, but when it does occur, can be, well, it can, can be, uh, tremendously important, which is when uh, you, you make extra copies of some segment of a gene or even a whole chromosome, because that kind of extra redundancy, if it doesn't cause malfunctions, allows there to be regions that are redundant that uh, if there are mistakes in those regions, uh, they're not harmful. If, if, if you know, if, if, if so, if you if you have redundancy to show you can already produce the product, then uh, a mutation that uh, produced that doesn't do that same function can uh, ne not be harmful, and uh, eventually you could stumble on mutations that are. Uh, beneficial. So uh, this kind of extra duplication is rare, but very important in the global pattern of, um, of evolution, because it allows vast new possibilities to be explored. So uh, events like that are, for instance, why different uh, creature, different animals have different numbers of chromosomes. Uh, and there are many examples you can point to of genetic regions that once that came from a common ancestor were duplicated and then uh, some of it got uh, repurposed. So that, that, that's, I guess, an additional source of variation that's very important. <laughs> That's kind of a supplement to uh, mutation and crossing over. Um, okay, here's another question. Are the horizons of life science still mostly classical or is quantum mechanics playing an important role in the way we have <laughs> Well, uh, everything is quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is, is uh, 
uh, you know, sitting sitting un under the hood of the chemistry. Uh, if you ask about really characteristically quantum mechanical effects, whether uh, um, superposition or entanglement play important roles in biology, so you really need you, students of biology could uh, only uh, at their peril ignore those parts that that the, the, those uh, more advanced parts of quantum theory. Uh, that hasn't been demonstrated. I think there there are possible places where those more subtle uh, aspects of quantum theory uh, come into play. It's been proposed, but I don't think there's general consensus that it's true that uh, some tunneling phenomena play an important role in photosynthesis. Uh, the, the, I think there is a pretty well-documented case, but it's a pretty esoteric one. Uh, birds in navigation need to sense magnetic field or are helped by sensing magnetic fields. And they use a very tricky quantum mechanical process to do that. Uh, I, I won't attempt to explain it, but it, it's a, a beautiful concept where you excite a spin and it rotates a little bit. And it, the direction of rotation depends on which, uh, how strong the magnetic field is. And then when it de-excites, how, how well it, uh, how the rate at which it de-excites depends on how much it's rotated. So you, you can use that. So but th that's a, a very special niche application, I would say, of the deep principles of quantum theory. I myself actually am now investigating the question of whether uh, breaking of time reversal symmetry at a molecular level plays an important role in biology. Um, I suspect that it does. Uh, and that would be close to quantum, <laughs> close to a quantum mechanical uh, application. Maybe, maybe the thing I should say the, the, is that quantum theory is at least important in that uh, the spin degree of freedom of electrons plays important roles in many biological processes. And spin is quantized angular momentum and its properties can't really be understood without quantum mechanics uh, it's it's very different from macroscopic angular momentum uh, and uh, of course the fact that electrons come in lumps that photons come in lumps that uh, atomic nuclei are, come in definite forms these are all consequences of quantum theory uh, so if broadly speaking, quantum theory governs everything and you can't, you can't be, there's no such thing as classical physics. Any, you know, there's physics and physics is, uh, is quantum. Uh, so it, 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 dividing it into classical and quantum is kind of artificial when you, when you get into uh, deep structure and chemistry. So I have a question. Uh, so the idea that we're going to evolve to be more brainy as in this Stapleton story is appealing, yes. but it's also notable that exceptional intelligence seems not to be evolutionarily favored in some way. No other species has anywhere near our intellect, uh, despite evolution having had many chances to create other smart creatures. And even in our own direct ancestry, there are hundreds of thousands of years of no technological advance in terms of stone tools, for example. Yes. Uh, so uh, in, yes. In, we're very well, much like chimpanzees that don't sort of uh, <laughs> progress for us. Uh, well, well uh, Malik, uh, let me speak for yourself. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, no, well, you're right. You're right, of course, but, but things are different. Uh, and we had a discussion a little bit along these lines last time. Uh, yes, I think, and you may be, I may be wrong, uh, but I think, I think what's happened in the last century or two in human history makes it qualitatively different from anything that happened before. Now we really understand how the physical world works at a very profound level. Now we really understand 
we're beginning to understand and have made vast progress, as I've discussed this time, in understanding what life is and how it works. And that knowledge gives power. Now, we may decide not to use that power, but the power opens up vast possibilities that um, that's that that's the message i guess well um, that was well, that wasn't quite my question my question was uh, do you think that uh, intelligent life uh, uh will turn out to be very rare because of uh, you know it seems yes to be i do well to... based based on what's happened here on earth if we uh if we extrapolate to exobiology, which I didn't discuss, it's basically because of lack of time. It's a very interesting subject, but kind of tangential, I think, to our future here on Earth, at least at least for a good while. Uh, the uh, um, but here on Earth, although life arose, life in the sense of the origin of the tree of life, uh, arose basically as soon as it was reasonably possible, as soon as the earth cooled off and stopped being bombarded by uh, meteors and asteroids very, very frequently uh, and then the crust uh, solidified, it, it was a matter of only a few hundred thousand years probably uh, for the tree of life to start in, in the tree of life, which persists to this day. Uh, on the other hand, if you ask about the emergence of what you would call intelligence, uh, and I don't know how you define that exactly, but effectively, uh, you know it when you see it, or more formally, you might say uh, entities that are capable of universal computation, <laughs> so Turing machines, <laughs> and human brains can function as Turing machines. Uh, the uh, We'll come to that next time. The uh, that's a very re recent development, and really technological situ uh, civilization and modern levels of productivity, as as you mentioned, really is a product of the last two hundred years or so. So uh, most most of the history of life does not feature mind or intelligence in in. Uh, in something comparable to human levels, modern human levels. That's that. So that just that difference in time scales leads me to think that intelligence might be rare, even 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 if life develops. I mean, because one develops very quickly, the other takes a long time, and was probably and seems to here on Earth to have been very contingent. Uh, you know, if 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 that asteroid hadn't hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs modern modern human intelligence well certainly human intelligence would would not have arisen in the way it has but even some dinosaur intelligence might might not have arisen uh there's no guarantee um it seems very contingent uh, if you study uh, paleontology and how modern humans evolved uh it's full of accidents and there was a small band of of hunter gatherers who made their way out of africa and so forth yes yeah, so it's it's uh, it was only a few hundred people based on mitochondrial dna and so for a long time it wasn't a very successful species and but here we are today um uh, and and you're absolutely right that uh um uh, and intelligence as such uh doesn't necessarily have high survival value <laughs> most most successful creatures and bacteria or maybe the most successful if you just count sheer numbers uh don't have intelligence and uh, uh life here on earth did without human levels of intelligence for a long time and there were many successful species that and and there are many successful species that have been around much longer than humans uh, that don't have anything like human intelligence. On the other hand, it might be that it's just that that's a hard intelligence. Once it reaches a certain level, really does have enormous survival value. Uh, 
as well as kind of cultural, ethical, moral value that, that once you have it, you want to keep it and, and develop it. Uh, but it's very difficult to evolve. And, uh, and that, that's also plausible because human, large human brains come at a high cost, as I, as I mentioned, and the payoff is not immediately obvious. Uh, and, uh, oh, wait, what was I going to say? Maybe that's what I was going to say. Yes, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. So uh, it could, I mean, for instance, life has never developed uh, the wheel even though the wheel is a very useful invention for getting around. Uh, and the reason is that it's very difficult to get there by incremental steps. And I think intelligence might be like that. It's very difficult to get useful levels of intelligence little by little. You need a lot in order to get over the barrier to where it becomes useful. Yes, it's not immediately obvious why Knowing, be, being able to do calculus has uh, survival benefits. But... No, it's only it's only clear in retrospect. Yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Um, okay. Oh, there. Here's one. That's uh, that's uh, because you mentioned science, uh, science fiction. Uh, uh, Danusia Gerlach is asking whether you've read Octavia Butler. Uh, yes. And particularly, well, I've read some of yeah. the, the parable of the the sower and the parable of the whatever the other one is. The, yes, I've read I read the two parable books. <laughs> um, and I think there's another question on its way, but uh, that was the question. <laughs> okay, that right. was just a question. <laughs> and, and I will I will discuss uh, Octavia Butler and some other uh, authors modern authors who've speculated about futures in the fifth lecture when we discuss scenarios. That's... We're almost out of time, but can you um, tell, tell us uh, why uh, there are only two sexes? It would seem like if we had any <laughs> more, uh, there would be a greater possibility of uh, more options in terms of survival and genetic mixing. Is that an accident? Uh... Well, there are huge examples and huge huge advantages in going from one to two, as I as I mentioned. Yes, uh, it's not so obvious that there are, what the big advantage is <laughs> going from two to three, and it would obviously uh, be more complicated. <laughs> and, uh, you'd have yeah. Well, <laughs> you'd have to. Be, there were a thousand. You would have to find. And, uh, one and, of the other nine hundred ninety nine. It's much easier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I think it, it it's an interesting logical possibility, uh, but as we've discussed with the wheel and intelligence, it's difficult to see the path to get from two to three. Now, of course, you might say it was difficult to see the path to get from one to two, but uh, the, given that two already has most of the advantages that you would get from three, it probably uh, is not something that's gonna catch on very easily. Okay, we have one last question in the yeah. one minute left uh, from Ethan, uh, who asks uh, basically uh, the Fermi paradox question. Uh, you know, do you think we would find any alien intelligence given that, uh, at least on the time scale of the universe, intelligent humans have been around for a very small time? Uh, and so uh, are we likely to? Yeah, well, I think, I think, the hypothesis that um, life, some well, life, in the way I didn't define it, I defined it as as this thing we see on Earth, but something like that uh, developing on other planets. I think, given the number of planets in the solar system that we're di discovering now with exoplanetary astronomy, including many that are Earth-like or even superficially better than earth as habitations for life uh that that life is probably fairly common in the galaxy uh i don't know if there would be thousands of examples or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions but there there, there might be a lot 
But intelligent life, it's not so clear as, as we just discussed in some detail. It seems to have been a very contingent thing on earth and very difficult to get to. Uh, so that might explain, so that together with the fact that uh, life is very difficult to detect from afar. People talk about the effects on atmospheres and, and with more sophisticated exoplanetary astronomy, we might be able to uh, detect signs of uh, metabolism taking place in a significant way that is lifelike on distant planets. Uh, but that's going to be very difficult. The You would think that technological civilizations, which do some of the things that I have mentioned, make Dyson spheres or send out swarms of uh, self-replicating robots to colonize the galaxy. If that happened, you would think it might be more obvious. Maybe it is. Maybe that's what maybe that's what the UFOs are all about. I I, I don't think so. But uh, but uh, the hypothesis the, the the hypothesis which suggests itself from looking at the history of life on Earth and thinking about it that life is fairly common, but intelligent life is very rare, I think is consistent with the data and uh, that that removes the paradox in a sense. Yeah, but. All right, we're out of time. So thank you, uh, Frank, for another wonderful and stimulating uh, presentation. Our, now we have a spring break coming up. So our next one, our next talk will be uh, on Wednesday, uh, March 15th. Uh, and that'll be both on Zoom as well as in person again. So uh, see you then. Yes, I hope to see you, some of you in person. Bye, -bye. Bye for now.